and welcome back to another episode of Catch Chat, where we dig into albums and eras and just talk about music history. I am Naturally Elise, and that's my bro. JR. And we are the R&B representatives, and we are welcoming back a very good friend of the show, one of our favorite guests. We love to have him on. Um, he's a historian. He's a lecturer. He's just a speaker he's just a whole bunch of things music nerd head his, like i said historian mr dart adams hello hey hello how y'all doing today we, <laughs> this, we when you've been on when i've been on this show pick particular show this many times it's funny how each one is different and how this one is going to be is different from the last show which was kind of like a cold case and this, oh, one's going, yes. this one's going to be more like a celebration or, or more like a, 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 a open discussion yes. where all, all of us have this love for this particular album for mm -hmm. a myriad of reasons. Yes. So I'm going to fully enjoy this experience here. <laughs> yeah. So, Mr. J. Ara. Yes. Tell the folks what we're going to be talking about today and why. Okay. So today we will be discussing Bruce Theory's debut, that 95 classic album. And so like Dart said, we did, um, we have done so many episodes with each other, which I love every last one of them. And um, the last one we did was a cold case, which <laughs> it was an album that we talked about with Adriana Evans, that debut, which y'all need to go check that out too. But we also talked about Groove Theory's album in that, because we mm -hmm. were like, yo, if if Adriana would have came out with this Groove Theory album, it would have been great. But it came out two years too late, and that kind of everybody kind of missed it. So we knew that Dart wanted to talk about this album because we he, he gave us three albums to talk about, and one of them was Groove Theory. And we was like, well, let's chill. Let's talk about Adriana. So when Elise was like, we got to get Dart back. I said, I already know what we're going to talk about, so there's no need. So we, <laughs> so we good. So yes, we're going to talk about this album. We're going to get into this Groove Theory album. My favorites was everything and where you were when you first heard it and all that good stuff. So Dart, where were you when you first heard this album? Where were you at? How'd you feel? All that. All right. So I graduated from Boston English High two years later than I should have. So I was almost 20 when I graduated high school. Crazy. My high school story is nuts. I spent eight years in high school. That's just neither here nor there. It's bananas. Now, you're like, how's that possible? Go to a 7 to 12 school, get kicked out, expurgated, and get, kicked, get kept left back a whole bunch of times, and then go to another high school where you spend three years after spending five in another. Anyways, <laughs> man. So how did you end up at Harvard? Don't ask. Now, um, <laughs> shit. Um, now, when we talk about groove theory, I had just finished high school. I was about to go to college. And since I had a messed up transcript, that meant I had to find another college to go to because all the Boston ones that were throwing all the money at me. So wait a minute. This is your ninth grade year? <laughs> nah, dog. You don't, you don't qualify for that and that shit. Nah. <laughs> so I ended up at Morgan State University in Baltimore, but I had to like, save money up and whatever to pay for tuition because I wasn't getting the scholarship money. And during that time, I was in Boston working. And this is when I first hear Groove Theory's first single, Tell Me. So I don't know how many of y'all exactly remember, but Groove Theory's Tell Me is released at the tail end of the summer, the single. Mm -hmm. yep. But the single had a life and grew and grew and grew over July, August, September into October. Like the song kept catching on. And singles had a had a longer life, a shelf life than they do in like now, modern and modern times. And also because you have to remember that this is 1995. Mm. This is singles could take between 12 and 16 weeks to enter the top 10 or top five on the R&B charts because they were that super hyper competitive, mm. right? So by the time we get to October 95, I've been banging Tell Me for like maybe 
two and a half, three months straight, had the single. Some people had the vinyl, had the CD single. Some folks had all three formats. <laughs> like, to give you an idea how impactful the single Tell Me was, it crossed over to the pop charts, right? 1995 is an incredibly competitive year for R&B. Mm. And it's set off by the fact that there are albums that are released earlier in the year that are still banging throughout the fall. So you could have dropped the album right in like the early spring and it still has legs entering 1996. Yeah. Perfect example, Mary J. Blige's My Life. Yes, that album, it wouldn't die. You know? At all. <laughs> yeah, it just wouldn't, right? And like, you think about Brandy. Brandy's album had dropped a minute ago, but she's still cranking out singles. Like Broken Hearted, had just hit, you know? Mm -hmm. We got faith on the precipice, you know? So all these things are happening. Uh, Escape. Escape had dropped off the hook. And like, mm -hmm. they just kept dropping singles. So all these things are happening. And when Tell Me comes out, it's like, what is this? The sound was different. Mm -hmm. Amel's voice. Then the video. Now, Remember the last time we were talking and we said, and I was talking about how 1991, I hated that entire era of videos. Yes. And I remember saying to my brother, yo, I hate this era of videos. Like, and I hated all the components in the different videos. 1995, I love this era of videos. I loved it. I feel like two, 1994 to 2000 is the golden era of music video, dead ass. So in 1995, I'll never forget seeing the Tell Me video for the first time on BET. And then seeing it again on VH1, and then seeing it again on MTV, I'm like, what the hell going on here? Because <laughs> you, you, you typically get a black music video yeah. from a new artist that wasn't already established, it was on all three of those channels. Yes. It's five. And that's what happened with Tell Me. And I'm just like, the hell going on here? <laughs> but it blew up, it crossed over. And then when the album comes out, so here's the crazy thing about uh this album that people don't always realize this album dropped i think either the same day or or uh, within a two week span of i think az uh az uh and um fat joe and oh no no it came out around the same time as fat joe's jealous ones envy and honest is all we got is us so it was like rip, really rapidly rap 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 in this right so I remember buying this, and I'm holding the CD. I bought the cassette of Onyx All We Got Is Us. I bought the cassette of Fat Joe's Jealous Ones and B, and I was like, oh, no, I'm getting this shit on CD. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the very same CD I bought the day it dropped. And my brother and I went back, because my brother, we, we like three years apart, we close, we were like in the same rap group, production team, all that. So we went home and played this CD, and we were just like, mouth the gate. Now we bought all the two other rap cakes. We played this first because we were like, we got to get this palate cleanser. You know, right. we can look at the grimy shit later. We need to right. get this in. Plus CD. This is this is playing on the on the on the stereo on the stereo in the living room. You know, we are, we, we were adults. Yes. <laughs> so. Uh, and then to your surprise, you, you cut it on and it knocked like the first like the hip hop album though. <laughs> right. yeah. So the very first, I'll never forget the first listen because the very first song is 10 Minute High, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. We've been hearing Tell Me Forever. Right. It was in its 14th week, I believe, the day it came out on the on, on the radio. It's in the top five R and B. Um and then okay, his was crazy, right? The, I believe the day, by the time this album came out, Tell Me is number four in Airplay and number three on the R&B charts. And to give you an idea what else was playing or was around that time, you got Brandy's Broken Hearted. Mm -hmm. You got Brian Carey's Fantasy. You know? Um, you got D'Angelo's Cruising. Prince, I Hate You. Yep. All right? So she's... Who theory, is, who theory is behind 
in between Brandy, Escape, Mariah Carey, and Prince. Ooh. Right? Mm. And, and what else is out at the same time? Deborah Cox, Sentimental, TLC, Digging on You. Mariah Carey had Fantasy, the Fantasy remix, and when this album is dropping, she's coming back with One Sweet Day. Ooh. So And Faith, Faith, um, I used, you used to love me. And she had just dropped her album. It's Monica, Miss Ang was out. D'Angelo's Brown Sugar. Mm -hmm. Jodeci, After Party, The Hotel. Escape was, Escape's Who Can I Run To was like the new single. So yeah. all that at the same time this dropped. And I remember playing 10 Minute High. Wait, and we're Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what the hell's going on here? It's only a 10 minute high. And we're just like, oh shit, okay. But then it goes to Time Flies, Ride, Come Home. Look, 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 here. look now. Me and y'all was just singing that last night. We couldn't stop singing. Yeah. <laughs> we're four songs in. That's a come to Jesus moment. We're like, the hell just. What's going on here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was the, and I remember that first listen to this album. So yes, um, it was the day it dropped, me and my brother in our living room back in Boston, South End, Lower Roxbury, 487 Mass Ave. And we're just like, yo, what's happening? And it's 1995. Everything's out. Right. Everything's right. out. Right. TLC. I think digging on you, it just dropped. That album, uh, Crazy Sexy Cool, wouldn't die either. So this is all they had to contend with. The biggest albums. Like, Mariah just dropped Daydream. Yeah, yeah. And we did this. Yeah. Yeah. And that's when Waiting to Fail soundtrack was out as well. Ooh, the Dead President soundtrack. Dead President. I was just about to say Dead Presidents. Mm -hmm. Damn. Mm -hmm. Everything was out. John, John B had come out. <laughs> John, John B had another had a uh, another single. Uh, I think Pretty Girl was a Pretty Girl. Yeah. yeah. So every 1995, everything's out. You know, it's like we talk about golden eras in rap, right? And in 1988, 1992, 94, it's like you dropped the joint and everybody dope is out. But this is the R and B equivalent. And also, again, to go back to what I was talking about with um, I Love This Era of Videos. This is a high quality, iconic video era. And that's what's pushing a lot of these artists. The Tell Me video is gorgeous. It's iconic. Not only that, but we're going to talk about something else in terms of like music that's just underrated because we don't even think about it like that anymore. We're going to talk about cover art. We're going to talk about presentation. The single, which I believe um, one of us has. <laughs> the Tell Me single. <laughs> over. Yes. <laughs> the font. The picture. Mm -hmm. One of the things that really sold Groove Theory that I, I know we people don't talk about nearly enough is that they had the look and the sound. Back in mm -hmm. the days when we were growing up, there were times when you had an artist look a certain way on the covers in the videos and they ain't even sing the damn song. They got a model. A <laughs> model. <laughs> oh, sorry. <Ooh. laughs> Catch all of that. Say it again, yo. Say it again. <clears throat> but I digress. <laughs> Amel LaRue was the woman singing. Right. She wasn't she was somebody placed there for aesthetics. No, right. she was a legitimate singer, singer of yeah. this song. And when you look at that cover art of the single, and, and the thing that drew people in was you see Amel looking like a grown ass woman, and you're like, oh damn, who's that? And then some woman comes behind you like, shit, who, who that? Looking at rights, and that they you see them both, right? Right, and then you hear the music. 
The video was amazing. The cover art of the single is amazing. Everything lined up. This font. What, what is this font? What is this? I, we need this. <laughs> this font here. Have I, I don't remember seeing this shit again. Why not? This hits. This slaps like a like a villainess in a novella. It kind of sort of the format of it, not the exact font, kind of looks like the back the faith track listing. You know yeah. how it's but yeah. I mean I wanna, yeah. it's not the same font, but it's the same kind of setup. Yeah. We don't talk I'm enough about designer. This shit just pretty. Got pretty this <laughs> look at look at look at the single behind you. All of these things factor in to why people went out and bought this and had it on every format. But the song, <laughs> the song was like, it was kind of a sea change, right? In yeah. 1995, we have all these different groups, all these big songs, all these big singles that were on the charts forever. But this one is the one that sticks out in your mind. Is like, this is what's on the horizon. This is where we're going with it, right? And like another thing we gotta talk about really quick. Okay, my mind was blown, my brother's mind was blown by this album, right? But we need to talk about this damn sticker. Again, this is the same copy I got the day it dropped in, I believe, October 24th, 1995. Yeah. The sticker says the dynamic debut album featuring Tell Me, lead single, 10 Minute High, Ride, and Hello It's Me. And none of those were singles. None of them. <laughs> none of them. <laughs> None. <laughs> okay. As, as we all know, typically, typically when you have the sticker on the album, it denotes what songs are going to be singles. Right. Or the standout songs on the album. Now, after hearing this the first time, my brother and I both look at this, look at the sticker and say, how come this sticker did not say, boy, <laughs> did you know, you know, Baby Love, even though that would have been my last choice for another single, Come Home, like, how come they didn't say these songs? <laughs> Don't get me wrong, Hello Was Me is fire. 10 Minute High hits you in the chest when the album, stuff, album begins, and I think it's a perfect choice to lead off the album given, you know, the sequencing of the album. Because right. you can't even tell me for th for three months, damn near over, and it completely like lets you know. All right, this is what we're gonna get into. This is how we're gonna lead you off. Right, right. And we're gonna we're gonna bring you in. You know, we're gonna wrap you in a swaddling cloth. And we're gonna bring you to the Euphrates River. You know what I'm saying? We're gonna <laughs> that. like that's pretty much what it did, right? Like that's what that's what that's what help. That's what Ten Minute High did. Off, off rip. And yeah. um, the album, the way it's sequenced and the way it plays out, yeah. it elicits an emotional response from you. And it's not like an album that's made for, hey, we going, we need you to dance. This is an R&B soul album. Yes. You know? Yeah. This is an album that you're going to have this euphoric feeling or this dopamine you know, hit immediately. Right. When you think about the idea of what drugs are supposed to do for you, when you get it, when you get hit, hit, had that first hit, and then you keep chasing it. Right. Kind of what this album did, but in a music form, right? So that's my, that's my memory, sense memory too, of the first time I heard this album and how that feeling and repeated listens, mm -hmm. It stuck with me for the last 27 going on years. Right. That's why we're right. sitting here. It's insane, right? Yes. 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 I, you know, I caught it late. I got it late. Honestly, I didn't even go lie to y'all. I caught it late because tell me, I, I think everybody and their mama loved the record. Like everybody was bumping that record. But it was like cool. And I love how you put, Dart, that a lot, it was so much out in 95. 
So it was so much that I was into that mm -hmm. this kind of got lost as getting it. Because again, I was still on Mary. You say, you know what I'm saying? Off the hook was out. Monica was out. Brandy was still kicking. It was stuff that was still knocking that I couldn't even, but I'm hearing tell me. And then I think what the second single had to be, keep trying, right? Yes. That's the second single. Okay. That's when we copped it. And that was in 96. Yeah. So I was already like five, six months late. And you got people talking about this. Like you hearing the whispers are like, yo, this album is new soul. It's new. It's fresh, which I don't like that word at all. But this is the new soul they're saying. Because like you said, Dar, it's like a feeling that you wasn't getting on these albums before then. So <laughs> when me and moms listened to this record, we was like, yeah, this is different. This is different, especially coming in to um, 10 Minute High, because that gave me Too High by Stevie. Mm -hmm. That gave me that vibe. So I'm like, oh, okay, she giving me Stevie, and then it's going to, and it's so New York. So it, it felt like home, because we had just moved back home. So mm -hmm. to get this, and to hear songs like y'all said, Time Flies and Ride and Come Home, and all these songs is so New York. It was like, yeah, this is... This is making us feel like we on the train, like, you know what I'm saying, on the L train, like, going home, like, it felt like that. So it was just, I'm, I'm mad that I didn't get it that, you know, the day it came out, because we normally good for that, but we didn't. But five months later, we got it, and we was like, well, yeah, this shit, nah. Like, this is a knocker, you know what I mean? And, and back to Tell Me, um, yeah. so I... <laughs> So I, I'm, I'm a bartender. I work at a bar. There's majority uh, white patrons, and um, but they get all this R&B. I'm playing nothing but. And you better keep doing that. That's it. But they doing all of it. And on my playlist, so they 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 get some hits, but they mostly getting some obscure shit. Anywho, <laughs> but, <laughs> but when tell me comes on, look. If it's a, now there's some black folk in there, they like really getting their knocking on the white folk. Not only do they know the song and get hyped for it, they be like, oh, that's Groove Theory. <laughs> wow. <laughs> the weird thing about, the weird thing about Tell Me is that Tell Me was top five RB and top three pop. Ain't that crazy? Crazy. And he, nothing else that they put out even came close to yeah. that kind of uh, crossover appeal, right? Yeah. Which is crazy because it just tells you that the frequency that which tell me hit was different. And again, I I can't I cannot. 1995 was loaded, but yeah. everything about this year going into '96 is heightened, like visuals. You know, again, cover art, presentation, music. It's so hyper competitive in this era, right? Mm -hmm. When we look back at this album, Goof Theory, it didn't go double platinum. Mm -hmm. It didn't go platinum. It made gold and plateaued. It, but here's the thing about this album. In the 20, almost 20s, going on 27 years since it came out, there have been other albums that people have played more, uh, probably listened to more, bought way more, get talked about way more. But when I go to uh, when I go to uh, Berkeley College of Music, when I go to any type of um, music or uh, school of, of performing arts, yeah. when I speak at any place where there are kids that are, like talented or talk to musicians or music nerds or heads, any gathering like that, the album that everybody's always going to talk about from 1995 is Groove Theory. They are stuck on this album. They talk about this album, they talk about influential, how influential it is. They talk about how that feeling that they got from the first time they played it and how they still play it to this day. They talk about how uh, Bryce's music mixed per per perfectly with Amel's vocals. Mm -hmm. And what Amel's vocals, what Amel did vocally on this album. And then like, when I think about the background, when I think about the layer of the vocals, Come on, when, oh, when I think man. about how she's, you can write lyrics, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what 
window, one more forgotten sun. That's words on paper. But when you go, boy at the window, one more forgotten sun, I like, God damn. That's me, that's me. You can write words. But the, same, the streets do. will never love you like I do. Like the streets will never love you like I do. Yes. Oh, I'll tell you something. There was a, a hilarious incident. I used to work in um Boston Public Schools, specifically like mainly English High and like other schools. So like I would go around all different parts of Massachusetts working for the state through the office of attorney general. I had life. Now that being <laughs> I work with a lot of young people. Yeah. So that means I'm working with directly with young people during the time where I'm working, I'm working in the lobby of the, of the high school and girls are walking into the school, bam, running into the front door. Why? Because they have their bangs in front of their eyes like a leader. This is the error, right? Yeah. You can't see this. I'm trying to be a leader. You're going to break your glasses. Um, and <laughs> I would, I would, there would be incidents where girls would be wanting to beef. It was like, bitch, who she looking at me? I can't stand her. This is just nothing. And like, I'm like, yo, calm, chill, chill, chill out. And then the girl finds out, like, she hears what's playing in the other girl's Walkman. And she's like, you playing Groove Theory? Yeah. Wait, what song was that? Did you know? Oh, girl, I love Did you know? <laughs> me too. What is, people don't talk about this album. Yeah. And I'm sitting there like, they were about, she wanted to beat her ass, but now they're going to be best friends for the rest of their high school career because she was playing Groove Theory. The things music do. The, the things music do, right? And yeah. so this era, right, really sticks out in my head as far as like music and, and art mm. and culture, right? Yeah. Who theory is one of the threads that everybody who, who came up during, and even people that came afterwards. Because when I'm talking, to, when I was talking at Berkeley College of Music, these kids were stuck on Groove Theory, and this album was out when their parents didn't even know each other. So to me, that is a, uh, it's indicative of how influential and how incredible this music is, but mm -hmm. also. The odd thing about black music where the most influential and beloved and most cited albums aren't necessarily the ones that um oh. yeah do the do the best in terms of like commerce and it, it's weird. Mm -hmm. Ain't it crazy? Y'all, y'all somebody tell me, and it's crazy because shout out to our, our brother Mark Chappelle, who did a, a thing for uh what was it, at least? Uh, For albumism? Yes, yes, that's what I couldn't think of it. Oh. But he did a, a, a thing like, and to find out that they didn't even like Tell Me Like That. Which is bugged. Like, it's bugged that a million of them didn't even like it like that, but the label pushed them to do it. Like, and to think that was the first single. You know what I mean? Because, like, me and Elise was talking last night. Any one of these songs could have been singles, honestly, if you really yeah. want to go, you know what I mean? But but tell me, and they didn't even like it like that. And then to know that a part of this song was built from Trey Lorenz' 1992 album, but it was left off. Oh, wow. Yes, like, Mark, like, yo, like, when he put that in the article, I was like, now, wait a minute now, because I love Trey Lorenz' 92 album. A lot of people haven't listened to it, but I love it. That's and, another it late. It was late. Yeah. <laughs> so he, so it didn't fit. So then somebody in 93 did it and it kind of became a B-side over somebody's overseas. But of course it was like, okay, whatever. But a million of them heard it and they were just like, ah, nah, we, we good. And then the label was like, no, 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 y'all should do this. And they did it and it becomes a big fucking smash. I'm like, why is it always like this, you know? Like, and uh, and I just, I just don't get it how they didn't like it, and we love it off the break. Like, you hear that? Yeah, it's yeah. Like, yes, like, yeah. yes. Uh. There are so many instances where someone hears the song, like that's the one. Ooh. I think it was a slam dunk in that case, and the hit is mind blowing. But also, one thing that always gets me about this album, right, and the rollout, you have Tell Me, which is 
is pretty much the reason this album even went gold, right? Yeah. But the thing that gets me is like, keep trying. I'm surprised that that song wasn't bigger because I feel like Keep Trying was in the same vein. But the fact that like, after that, I feel like they didn't know what singles to put out because this, based on how long it's been played, how long we stuck with it, how when I went to Morgan State in, in January 1996, Every other dorm room had this album in it in O'Connell Hall, which was the thug dorm at Morgan State University. Like, it was grimy out there. We had three gangs in, Morgan, in, in O'Connell Hall. We called it OC. It was at the edge of campus. Everybody was scared to go there like it was, like it was the, uh, a notorious housing development. They treated it like Soundview Projects in, in the Bronx, right? <laughs> like, and, and the funny thing is that O'Connell Hall is right next to a cold spring. Right? So everybody's all up there, all grimy, all thugged out, a bunch of dudes just in there fighting and, 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 and slap boxing with each other and selling weed and shit. And every morning we wake up to the sound of a brook. <laughs> right? A sound of a brook. And we went outside, there were ravens cawing at, at the front door. And this is, this is where, <laughs> and these dudes would just come out by half the, half the, half the dorm wearing Timberlands other half wearing sneakers and <laughs> everybody's from the, the the hardest places in in, in the united states of america <laughs> and um overseas and everybody had this album everyone had this yeah you know yeah. and like me that's just indicative of just like how much this album stuck with people and again i can't tell you how many people that i instantly bonded with because of their love of Groove Theory's album, but also why didn't this album have the same kind of, you know, long run that other albums from this year had, especially if you're going into 1996. It's not like the window closed in 96. Mm -hmm. If anything, it opened because mm -hmm. more music like this was coming out. Right. This is where we, because a, Groove Theory's album did not sound exactly like the R&B that was banging all through 95. But when we get through 96 and 97, this seems like, you know, the Rosetta Stone. Yeah. Right? Like, up through 96, <clears throat> you're like, yo, you could have dropped Groove Theory at any time between October 95 and like June 97. Yeah, that's true, man. That's true. But but you, you you know how it goes in music or just the arts period. Like a lot of times the pioneers of sounds get that lost part. in the shuffle. So if you kind of were in the group of first people doing it, they might pick one person that kind of was doing the thing that started it and then everybody else gets forgotten or shut, you know. Could think, could think swept up on the side. Could think about it, y'all. Like and speaking of groove there, right? And then Brown Sugar came out in July, right? Yeah. Of 95. But this album was a sleeper. Like people uh -huh. didn't dig Brown Sugar when it first came out. Like, oh my God. I hate when people be online and be like, oh my God, yeah. When it came out in July of 95, they hit. No, it did not. Like that album did not hit like that. It didn't mm -hmm. hit so much later. Like, it yeah, it took a minute. So I'm feeling like his sound was different. Groove theories was different, but I love what you said, y'all. I felt like by the time Tell Me came out, they didn't know what singles to go with, and it got lost because it was yeah. like, so why Keep would Trying came Bina? out in what January, huh? January, February. Keep Trying right. came out January, yeah. right? Of ninety six. Yeah. yeah, January, February. So it's like you brought that out, which I thought was a great, great record. Honestly, I think it oh, was yeah. a great record, but then. <laughs> It was like people were still loving Tell Me so much. They couldn't let it go. They couldn't let that single go. It was just like in 96 at the Apollo Theater. This is the summer of 96 where they're on Apollo. They're performing Tell Me. Everybody's loving it. But then when she's doing Keep, when they're doing Keep, uh, keep Trying, I think. I mean, people rock into it, but it's like you can tell like they like, yo, throw on Tell Me again. You know what I mean? Like She could have performed it. They could have fought it three times and people would have been fine. And they would have loved it. They would have okay. loved it. 
I, I don't I want to ask you all a question. Okay. Is and it happened and I remember it was me and my me me and my friends, their girlfriends, and we were all in the apartment. And when it happened, we just started dying laughing. So back in the days, they inside stuff, right? And this is the yeah. Mod Rashad. This is past with uh -huh. Obey. Mm -hmm. And they are doing something for like All Star Weekend, right? And at the time, it's um, who did the song Fawns and um Venus Mars? What was it? Uh, um, the After Party. What's the name of the group that did the oh, song? Uh, Coffee Brown. Yeah, Coffee Brown. So Coffee oh, Brown, yeah, yeah, yeah. who opened it up. Coffee Brown performs the After Party, and they do the entire song, and everybody is jamming. Everybody's jamming, right? Mm -hmm. And then they come around and Amar Rashad and them come out and they do the whole thing that they're doing for the All-Star Weekend. It's like, and now to close it out, Coffee Brown. And Coffee Brown looks at the crowd, looks at the audience and everybody, and they say, run it back. And they do the after party again. <laughs> and everybody loses their mind. Yes, yo. We, we were crying, laughing, because we were like, they, couldn't they do like the B-side or couldn't they do a song from the album? No, because the <laughs> party had that shit rocking. Yeah, so yeah, they, yeah. And yeah. and the weird thing is to me that like there was other great choices for a third single. Like, did you know I think would have been a good choice? Boy at the window, I don't know if that would have worked as a single. Um, no, that wouldn't radio wouldn't have come home. But Come Home seems like a viable choice for a single to me. They went right? to Baby Love. But they went with Baby Love. But bow, I, feel like, bow. <laughs> I feel like if they weren't going to do a remix, well, wait, they did do They did have a remix. They and did. A remix. And yeah. I like the remix. The remix, better. the remix is a thousand times better. Yeah. But the thing is, the remix didn't, the remix didn't make a noise. It didn't. It didn't. I, it, I barely remember hearing the the Baby Love remix on any mix show. We didn't make any mixtapes, you know? Like, and that's crazy because think about everybody else's remixes in R and B in '95 going into '96. That was the height of that. Joe see yeah. bringing on uh uh Wu Tang yeah. on those uh fucking we got oh my god, we had D'Angelo with A Z. And Primo on the Lady Remix. Woo! We, we had, like Mariah Carey had just come off the Fantasy Remix. Fantasy was a huge song in and of itself. All right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. The Fantasy Remix, though. <clears throat> the Remix. Uh, why am I doing a Remix? Um, but but like you got to think about stuff like, and when we're getting into like groove theories, tell me. Yeah, that era is Brandy's broken hearted single. But the thing about Brandy's broken hearted single was that there were different mixes of that. And then there was yeah. the one for the video. And like the video was insane because Hype Williams did it, had them in water and her and Wanye in water. And I'm like, huh? But like, <laughs> D'Angelo's coming off cruising. And this is when his album starts going from. Platinum Plus, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And Deborah Cox starts showing up with Sentimental, and then like it starts taking off for her too. Monica's about to be out of here. Brandy's coming back, right? So, and then we hit ninety six, and like it just boggles my mind. There, nobody could have made any like adjustments. Nobody could have figured out a way to give this album more of a life. It, it just, it yeah, it's, yeah. It, it, this album really could have been pushed like more. Honestly, it was so much. You know how we say albums are like single driven. How we yeah. say now, like people just throw um so albums together and it be all singles. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? They're like Rihanna, no offense. But at the end of the day, with this, you could have threw so much. And it was so New York during that time. And I'm like, like you said, you could have threw out Did You Know as a single, yo. Like, that could have mixed up with so many playlists on different mm -hmm. radio stations. And it would have hit. 
You know what I'm saying? Like you said, a dope video, everything. The promo that they put behind Tell Me, they're going to put that behind, you know what I'm saying? Did you come home? Like you but ooh, come home. <laughs> the question is, right? Did did Tell Me hit and it surprised the label? Or did they know it was a hit out the gate and they pushed it versus they just didn't put the same effort into the other singles? Because I feel like Keep Trying could have done more, you know? Yeah, yeah, I do too. But also you did say that like I, you felt like maybe fans were so stuck on Tell Me that they wanted another Tell Me. And that's crazy because when you look at D'Angelo, you know, Brown Sugar, Lady, Cruising. None of them sound the same. At he all. wasn't giving you the same thing. You know, he wasn't giving you the same thing. <clears throat> was fact, not not really any song on the album don't really sound like any other song. On exactly. The album. What happens when you make a song that's so impactful and hits so hard that people want another one of those? And But the thing on top of that, it's not like we're talking about an album that the single is the star of the album and that's nothing. To me, the star of the album is the album. The star <laughs> right. Of the album, right. The, the body vocal, of work. Yeah. The, the, the everything. Like, perfect example, right? Did you know? It's Amel and LaRue doing the back and forth, singing together. It's the blend of their vocals, right? And all of that makes that song what it is. It's not like Bryce is God Almighty and it's like, I could put anything on this and it's going to hit. No, it's Bryce and Amel. And I think, did they have a contentious relationship? I don't, I don't yeah, I think it was creative dis differences that, um, yeah, and why they left and why she decided to go solo. Because you see, when she left, she made her own label and she probably was irritated with the, the industry, the big mm -hmm. labels. Cause she went and made Bliss Life and and put out all her stuff on there. She said Prince told her to. Prince was like, "It would be better if you would go independent." Cause I think again, like we said with Adriana, you did what the label wanted, you did what everything you wanted to do, and you still get shitted on. You know what I mean? And then another thing I think with that would tell me everybody probably wanted another maybe duet type of thing. Because remember, people didn't even know that was Trey Lorenz. People thought that was Bryce. Oh. Nobody thought it was Trey Lorenz on that record. Nobody I thought that did. for years. I, I thought, thought that, that for years. years. I didn't know it was Trey. Didn't. It That's was like, I heard that voice before, but I was like, well, maybe it's Bryce. I'm like, I mean, they are a group. You know what I mean? Because I'm like, I heard that voice before me loving his album. I'm like, I know that voice, but I'm like, yeah. Okay. That that part of Tell Me was very Saturday Love, too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because they you kind know? of going back and forth with yeah. each other. Like, mm -hmm. but it was that element with, and did you know when her and LaRue were going back and forth, right? And singing That's together. True. But, the thing, true. but the thing about this album, right, is that it's not, again, it's not one of these joints where it's just like, there's the single and there's this song, this song, this song. This is a top to bottom play album. This is a let the whole album ride album. This is a oh wait, I'm gonna I'm in I'm in this feeling, so maybe I'm gonna play this joint five times. Right. You know mm -hmm. what I'm talking about. Yes. So question. Question. So Groove Theory was on Epic. Right. Who else was on Epic at that time? Because then that could explain it because the well, there you go, your answer. <laughs> Sony Epic. Sony so, Columbia Epic. They all they go together. Mariah, they put the money behind their golden goose. Yeah, they because his, here's what happened, right? Because again, we I've talked about this a few times already. Fantasy, the fantasy remix, but then Mariah comes back with one sweet day. Yeah. Yeah. And one sweet day was a uh, monster. Yeah. It was a monster. Yeah. A, a two-headed monster. It was a, a monster on the monster. charts and mm -hmm. rawr on my senses. Uh, uh, girl. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, 
<laughs> but yeah, that, that's just what it was. That. But yeah, that's that's all. Uh, and that's all. It, would not it would not die. No. <clears throat> and you know, I like this album too, y'all. For me, because after listening to a couple of days, when I was listening to when I heard it in like '96, I was like, this album is very Marvin Stevie ish. For real, because I'm like, if you hear the boy at the window, right? Doesn't that give y'all like vibes of inner city blues? Yeah. I feel like she the boy is looking outside his window or what the hell is going on around him. And Marvin was doing the same thing with that. Then I was like, you know, um, 10 Mile High was giving me Stevie. Hell, keep trying was giving me, don't you worry about a thing to me. It's so positive and so great and just so this. And I was just like, then her background vocals. That's why I'm glad you brought up Dart. Like her background vocals on this album is like master class. Like, oh my God, the stacking and all of this. You know what I mean? Like it was just so that's why I can hear Did You Know over and over on like what she did on Hello Is Me. Like, oh, oh like, like, like this, Jesus, like. Like when we talk about soul R&B albums, right? Yes. This yes. feeling of soul R&B albums, me, I'm an old. So I grew up at the time when I had to have permission to play my mom 45s. But yeah. also my big brother is five, six years older than me. My big sister is eight, nine years older than me. Uh. So, and they had to like watch me touch records, vinyl. Mm -hmm. and with the utmost care to play them on the record player because this is the era of um you ain't you don't touch the records. I could read them. I promise you I learned how to read early because so I could just read albums, right? And also right. my mom player. So I used to I was trusted to put in the eight tracks the right way. And you can't rewind or fast forward eight tracks. Come on, tell them um, you gotta over, wait till it play over again. Over, <laughs> yes. So I come from that era of listening to soul R and B. And right. these are the albums that I'm first introduced to. The idea of like listening to the Jackson Five singing a song that they should not be bodying reflections. And the way no. they do the whole oh. and the street lights, street lights, reflections of like this ain't a song for boys, young boys to be singing, a a a, a, a teenagers to be singing. And they <laughs> killing this shit. Yes, they are. Okay. Right? Now and then I'm listening to the R&B and the way they do the vocals and they blend the harmonies. And this is the era of like new technology in the studio where, hey, let's stack these vocals and pan these vocals and do all this stuff. And so when the album comes out, it's going to be a different experience, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I grew up on. And we're in 1995 going into 1996 and everything's digital in the studio. We got if you have a 20, if you don't have at least 24 tracks in your studio, people are looking at you like, this is, what is this? Like, man, right. you, need to get, right. you need to get a drug dealer to fund your shit or something. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> and, and when you listen to this album, yeah. it elicits those kind of emotions and that kind of sense memory from that kind of R&B, right? But you could rap over these beats. That's what I was saying. It still was street, yo. Yeah. Ugh. And Amel has this quality to her voice and her vocals and her delivery that it's not just I'm listening to someone sing. Mm -hmm. Motherfucker, you transformed. When you when those headphones are on, you somewhere else. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Out of speakers, there's times, right? When I've been walking on a city street, on a sidewalk, and I've heard this album blaring out of somebody's window or at a storefront, and I turn and I look, and it's like I could see the music, or it grabbed me. Mm -hmm. song, and I'm just like, oh. like okay, yes. everybody, like it's asking me, what you doing here? What set you claim? Yeah. <laughs> get, your, get your synesthesia popping where you can yeah. see it. <laughs> Yes, and like you, it's almost like you remember when you go, went to the barbecue and the grill, and right above the grill, the air looks different and it's wavy. Yeah, yeah, yes. That's some of these songs, based on her vocals and the mix with the music, like there are so many things done on this album that 
you can write a song, but the way she sings it, the way the way the vocals are recorded, the way the backgrounds come in, the way they yeah. blend the vocals, the harmonies, the runs, this is extra credit. You mm -hmm. know, this is extra credit. Like, I could write you a song, maybe not me, some other motherfucker, but I could, you could write a song <laughs> for somebody and you could have music playing, but you get a melon there and she's going to do something special. She's going to yeah. do something. And the blend of her and Bryce was magic. Yeah, it was sort of magic. That's why, again, I ain't never let this Joan out. Yeah, because you lived at your Adriana and you never got it back. <laughs> no! Like, my brother has my Adriana Evans CD. And it's <laughs> on the Evans CD because it ain't mine. It's ours. And it's telling that I have this, but right. he has But also, it's telling because I guarantee you that in his house right now, there's at least three of them joints. There's at least three of these. There's three of these. <laughs> Between him and his family, there's at least, yeah. at least three, at least three, at least three. One in the basement, yeah. one in the living room, one upstairs. Yes. So you know what? In my lifetime, one of the most excited I've been about a release of an album, and I got definitely got a D first day that it was mm -hmm. out. Oh, yeah. I don't yeah. think I've <laughs> ever been anticipated anything more, and it did not mm -hmm. disappoint. Mm -mm. I have that on. Nor CD did the me. next one, or the next nope. one. Now that's nope. standards, y'all can have that. Nor the next one. Look, I play ice cream every day for Look. like three straight weeks. Three straight weeks. I wrote so much. There was this one stretch where, um, uh, did you see? You can't see me. Like that joint. Mm -hmm. I played that joint. I had that on loop for uh, 15 minutes to finish writing something. Like, I love it when that happens, when you can play a song and you and, just loop it. Why oh you, you don't care. Right? And Dark, speaking of ice cream every day, the last 30 seconds of You're the Ish. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> I say God damn. And I thought when I got the album, just from the title, I was like, this is going to be the song I don't like. Wrong. <laughs> don't you love it when that happens? Yes. 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 <laughs> but, but yeah. Um, but on this album, Get Up sounds like Tell Me and Keep Trying Had a Baby. Get mm -hmm. Up. Yep. So to me, it all starts here, right? Because yeah. my love of Amel is solidified here, right? But the thing is that, like, when Bryce got another singer, mm -mm. I couldn't be bothered. I yeah. couldn't be. It I didn't. And, and it's, the thing was, the music wasn't bad, you know? It's just that his music with Amel's vocals and Amel's everything yep. made this. I think, is there a better word than magic? Is there a better word? Is there, is there a more descriptive word? Mm -hmm. I'm holding this CD, right? And I'm talking about this album almost 27 years later right. because of everything that this album means to me as a music fan, right? Everything this album means to me as somebody who loves what music can represent and embody. Right. And that emotional connection that emotional response that's unlocked by a song or certain song lyrics, right? Or mm -hmm. maybe it could just be the way you fucking hum. Mm -hmm. Coming into 10 minute high. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yo, she did the lyric. And when I heard, dum, 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 I was yeah. already, okay, oh, all right. You know who you singing this for? The world. Yeah. I'm like, what the? F and the thing is that, like, 
I can't imagine what do you what, what, what do you do different with this album? Do you what songs would you put in what place? And again, this I didn't have this on cassette, so it wasn't a side A side B situation. It was played yeah. all the way through. And when you have it in that digital format where you can skip songs, I, I never thought a day in my life to raise my finger, my black Tino ass finger, and press a button <laughs> to skip a song on this here album. Never thought it, never had the thought, never once. Matter of fact, just talking to y'all right now, this is the first time I've ever contemplated what would I put in a different place? Of these 14 songs, what would I switch out? What song would I take off the album? I never thought that ever once. Yeah, I don't I don't think me playing this, I don't think I've ever skipped a song while, while playing it. Me either. And I'm not even ever. the biggest fan of Baby Love, but I don't skip it because it fits. Oh. It yes. fits. Mm -hmm. As much as I'm not the fan of it, it fits. Like it's like okay, I get it. Because the sequence doesn't make sense. Home. It's come home, then baby love, then tell. And me. you tell me, right? Like and then hey you. Yeah. And then that was smart because then it, then it goes down a tempo, goes to hello it's me, which slows it down a little bit, and it, it's just, yeah. it just works for me. And do y'all think? It's a perfect track listing. Do y'all think that since Amel wrote these songs? She put more, cause you know, like, like, dark, like you said earlier, you said somebody can write the song, but it's just the way you deliver the record. It's like, it's something different. But with her, with her writing these songs, she's putting herself into it, so she know what she wants to hear. She knows what she wants people to see, and all this. And maybe that's why the backing and the stacking was so great. Cause she like, nah, I wrote this, so I want this here. I want to stack here. I want these background vocals to come in on here. Cause I'm sorry, like the background vocals on Did You Know, like how it comes in out of no fucking way. Like you just lit and it's just, uh, it's like, whoa, wait a minute. I'm I'm here for the beat and you come in with these backgrounds that was like, whoa, shit. So I'm like, maybe that's the reason. Maybe because of her writing and she can put more of herself into it rather than somebody giving her a song. Cause I mean, you can tell kind of the difference for me. You can tell the difference of here is um, Hello It's Me. Cause we know that's a sample. So we know, okay, she gonna kind of put her own little twist to it. But then when you hear everything else on the album, it's like, yeah, Amel is eating this shit up. Don't get me wrong, she ain't, you know, Hello It's Me. But to me, you could tell the difference of her writing and, and then the difference of her just covering a record to me. Yeah. This well, is my rendition. Yeah. Well, after this album, she went and did everything because I'm reading the line of notes of Infinite Possibilities. Yeah. The players, the Mel LaRue, lead vocals, keyboard bass, roads, shaker, keyboards, all backgrounds. <laughs> Yo, that's first and she's the executive bunny, producer. First base, Bugs Bunny, second base, Bugs Bunny, third base, Bugs Bunny, short stop, Bugs Bunny, <laughs> picture, Bugs Bunny, manager, Bugs Bunny. Goddamn. But also, when you look at the line of notes, of this album, right? Yeah. She's co-executive producer with Jimmy Henchman and Bryce. Yeah. Oh, she was a co-producer too. Co-executive oh. So like, oh, shit. So, and then like the beauty too, right? The lyrics are in the damn album. I jet. always love that. I one. miss those, yo. Oh. Like, what's, mm. do I? Well, she didn't stop doing that because all the yeah. lyrics is on Infinite yeah. Possibilities. Look at this. Look wow. at this. Wow. She kept that. But yeah, you know, when I you think know about she was a co-producer though. Y'all, wow. They, they had everything, right? They had the look, they had the sound, they had the visuals. Um, they were highly marketable as a duo, right? Yeah. Because when you have a woman that sounds and looks like a male. Yep. And the dude that can make music and looks like Bryce. Yep. The sky's the goddamn limit. You know what I'm saying? That's a blank check right there. But Dang. it's stuck here with this album. Get yeah. head, music heads, musicians, vocalists alike, all love and sight. And they go back to this album. And even I'll say 18 to 24 months after this album kind of fell off the charts or whatever, 
if you walk into somebody's home or you're in somebody's car and you see this or they're playing this, it's the energy, the energy instantly shifts. It changes, it transforms because, oh, you're a man of culture too. You know, like that shit instantly happens or, oh, okay, I see what you on. <sighs> There's just something about this particular album that resonates with people and has for the last 26 plus going on 27 years. And it's funny because we could talk about this to the cows come home and break down what did what and how. The bottom line is that here's a question, right? That I'm really getting to. Do you think if they made a second album, it could have topped this? Ooh. That's the real question. I think if they didn't go into it, I think it might could have. Because you know people was always with that sophomore jinx. Mm -hmm. So if they would have just went into this next album like, all right, we started something, less now the growth. You know what I'm saying? We done, Now we're living through this industry now. Let's and let's be different. You know what I mean? Because technically, can y'all see a male doing Make Me High? Tony's? Because that's what Bryce, that's what yes. Bryce did next. You yes, because she would have right? made it, but it would have sounded, uh, I think it would have been a way better vocal performance. And, yeah. you know how, and you know how hard I go for Tony. So right. for me to say that. Hmm. And I think it would have been. I can see that. Different, and I think it would have been a hit. Honestly, honestly, because it still has that swag of groove theory to me. Because why? Bryce produced it, so you know what I mean. So yeah. I, I think they could have did great. I think. So I, so I had another thought. So <laughs> okay. in the Tell Me video, Amel is pregnant. I wonder, you you know, in the music industry, they don't. Especially then, they don't want to deal with pregnant and dealing with, with that. I wonder if that had effect on how the label maybe treated her and as far as promo and the fact that she had a new baby as far as, you know, she might have not want to And sidebar, I went to see Amel and that baby was playing the keyboards. Mm -hmm. Damn <laughs> it. <laughs> you pick up an Amel album and it's her and her daughter singing? Wow. Wow. <laughs> And that baby was playing the hell out that keyboard too. <laughs> but I'm, you know what? I wanted to tell y'all too. That's gonna fuck y'all up though. And <laughs> this is me doing the research and be a video. I mean, a, a music learner. I'm trying to be like dark when I get older, for real, for real. But uh, y'all, do y'all know that Ten Mile High was actually the first single that was released in 1994? Ten Minute High. Yep. What? Wait, hold on. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Wait, wait, Go wait, wait, on, because wait. the reason why I found this, uh, I found this a couple of months ago. Um, they released it in 94, and they have a promo single for this. Shut the fuck up. Check out on Discards. I'm Ten on Discards right now. I'm on Mile Discards. High was released in 1994. And allow all cookies. Into the damn box. I'm myself. That's why I was like, I wonder if Dark knew this. And it was a promo single released in 1994. That was the first single. 10 minute high, 12 inch promo, 550 music, 1994. Bam. How much is that motherfucker? Is somebody selling it? <laughs> oh my God. Crazy. So could you imagine if that would have hit and it would have been a big record? And then they would have dropped Tell Me right after that? Taken from the 550 Music Epic Release Groove Theory. That's since like 1994? Wait, yeah. how long would it this album? <laughs> Are you kidding me? A couple of months ago. That's why I was like, I know Dodge. Jay I ain't even telling me this one. He wanted to. Oh, this... I <laughs> fuck up the thing. <laughs> what? I, I appreciate you keeping this from me, sir. Right. You know why? You know why, sis? Because we brought up 10 Mile High, and I was thinking about it, and I said, oh, shit, I forgot that was actually a promo in 94. 
That happened. Now, then we just realized the same shit happened to fucking what's the name? Adriana with that fucking reality in 95, and they didn't drop her album to 97. So same thing happened with them, dropped in 94. We ain't hear nothing about it, and the tell me comes out, blows the fuck up. Okay, so something that Brute just what did you know that in the UK Baby Love was the lead was a single and keep trying was the B side? Hell no. What? Yeah. I'm looking at it right oh, now. Another cold case episode with Dar. Ain't this some shit? <laughs> three, three different mixes of, of Keep Trying is the B side. The hip hop mix, the go go mix, and the wet mix. The wet wow. mix. Wow. I don't know what the hell this is. Australia, UK, a white this label. Crazy. White label. So, I wait, was... it was so Baby Love and then Keep Trying was the B side. What the hell? That doesn't even sound right. No. And, and see, Dar, it makes a lot of sense. Afterwards, they didn't know what to do. They didn't we know what singles to throw. They threw out 10 Minute High, didn't do nothing. Tell Me blows up. But then in the UK, they had freaking Baby Love and freaking Keep Trying. That did nothing. They didn't know where to go. They did not know where to go with this album. Who was the A&R? Like, <laughs> mm -mm 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 -mm. Wait, made a... Well, I know that yeah, it might be on the Harris there. Davis. Who well, he need to be rapper. He need to That's be. That's the A R. Like, Harris Davis. Uh, Harris Davis. Well, he messed up big time. Big I time. I don't know him. I don't. Or she or her. <laughs> right. <laughs> but again, this is Epic Sony Columbia. Who's their big dog? Mariah. Mariah keeps the lights on. I kept the lights on. Yes, she did. Because then again, you also got to know who's coming out in 95, too. Michael was about to come out with history. So they was putting all that focus on him. Yeah. History had was out. And, I mean, when you look at, like, the landscape, right? <sighs> Prince had the gold experience popping, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so yeah. There's so much happening, right? Yeah. And album like this, if maybe if it wasn't, because the, the, the thinking is, like, if it wasn't for for Tell Me, would this album have completely have been buried in that era? And then the other question is, you know, the other remaining question is, does the Groove Theory follow-up album, does it do what this album couldn't? And I just feel like after this project and this experience, that maybe it was just one of those things where a, a Mel was just like, I'm good. I could do this on my own. But the thing is that she did it on her own, you know? And, and made amazing. Like her, listen, <laughs> after it's Infinite, okay. she made Infinite Possibilities. And I was like, okay. I, I still was like, I, you know, I don't know what she can top this. And then Baby, that Brave Bird. That Brave Bird. Yes, Ooh, God. That's my... <laughs> And in that morning, and, the, and ice cream every day. and oh. So to me, it's like. And they all sound different. Yeah. Now I think about Infinite Possibilities and buying that album and listening to it. I immediately was like, you know what? Maybe the best thing is that we never got a second Groove Theory out. Because if we, if I, if I think back, would I rather have a Mel's career as is or another Groove Theory album? I'm picking a Mel's career 12 times out of 10. Oh, yeah. yeah easy, yeah. easy clap. Yeah. All yeah. day. Agreed. 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 I agree with that. Yeah. Because just what she was able to do like solo, her. and then she was able to have full creative control. Full. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. I agree. I totally agree with that. I agree. Because, I mean, but it could have been like what D'Angelo did with Brown Sugar and then Voodoo. I don't think so. Because you don't think so? I don't think so. Because the crazy thing when you think about it is the people that D'Angelo was running with were the same people that Mel were running with. Right. Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> You're right. You're right. You're absolutely right. You're right. I was, You're right. Watching, I was watching Coke commercials, and I'm like, is that a Mel with Amir and, and Rashid and, and Yeah, you're right. 
Oh, I'm talking about Quest Love and Common. I'm sorry. I, I know people. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I almost, almost fucked up to call some other rappers by their by their name. What, by their rapper wasn't, name. wasn't it now Quest Love's prom date? Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So they roll with the same crew. So yeah, you're right. Maybe, mm -hmm. yeah, I agree with you, Dart. Yeah, I, I tried to get it out out of it. Like, well, maybe, but yeah. no. I just feel like when again, I'm so glad you brought up infinite possibilities. It was going to happen, but with that one, yeah. <laughs> when when I think about like as much as I I'm attached to this album, mm. and as much as I wonder about why it didn't do more. All those questions leave when I think about Amel's career and what she did and her songs, right? Mm -hmm. I hear Amel's vocals in my head when I think about this album. I think yeah. about what Amel did on these beats when I think about this album. Mm -hmm. I think about this album and I love this album dearly and I'm attached to this album Largely due to the fact that it was Amel who was the singer and the writer and the person who, you know, executed what had to be executed. It's not a case where it's like, this singer doesn't have that producer. They need to get back together. I've never had that thought ever. I've never had that thought that, you know what? I'd like to see Amel get back with, um, get back with Bryce. Never. Cross no. never crossed my mind once, you know. No. It has with other artists. Anne Marie loved Anne Marie dearly, but if you could have gave me a, a a Marvel what if wish, I would have had her and Rich Harrison. Rich back. Harrison. Yeah, yeah, that's I real. Back with that peanut butter immediately. Yes, yes, God. But I don't have that feeling with with Bryce and Amel. I just don't. Mm -mm. I agree yeah. with you, y'all. I I would take a career over a second album though. I would. Mm -hmm. I would. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, it's my favorite part of the show. <laughs> oh, yeah. I can't wait for this. <laughs> and today's word association slash song association is albums from 95. And, Ooh. you know, you've done this a couple times, so you know what to do. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but for, for new viewers, first song or memory or thought that comes to you when you hear this name of this album. All right. Yes. So we'll start off with Way Next Hill. <sighs> Sounds right. <laughs> Iconic. Iconic. The reason why the Wait Next L soundtrack is iconic is because this is theme music for people's lives. This is theme music for an era of their life, a stage of their life. This is theme music for an entire generation or a micro generation at least. Yeah. Um, when you heard the songs on this album or saw it in somebody's apartment, or car, or on their stereo, or heard it playing in whatever they had, Walkman, CD player, what have you, you knew this music is speaking directly to that person, you know? And that's a rare thing. And that's why this album is so beloved to this day. So yeah, iconic. All right. Uh. Um, Basically, the rest of these are going to be ones we mentioned in the show already. Um, Prince, the gold experience. <sighs> Legacy, right? Because Prince wasn't called Prince when the gold experience came out. It was the right. symbol. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was basically like, we, what are you doing now? And when I Hate You comes out, it's crazy because it was yeah. kind of like, Harkening back to the old, the shit he used to do, mm -hmm. but doesn't do anymore. But he was still like, nah, I can still do that. Yeah. Yeah. And, I know. <laughs> Prince, at the time, the artist or the symbol, loved to do things where he would look at the RB landscape and slap people across the face like, 
I started that shit. What you talking about? <laughs> what you call it? Uh, Keith said that in our episode. We talked about mm-hmm. uh, Signs of the Time. He said the same yeah. thing. He'll see what the hell going on and be like, oh, I did that shit already. But I'll I, I, I yeah. fuck with you again, but I did it. <laughs> so, like, you listen to Come, right? And he was just Woo! like, oh, I don't do that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to put I'm gonna put horns on that shit, right? So the gold experience was like that. So it was like legacy. It was it was pretty much telling everybody, y'all think I'm over here with it and I'm gone and I'm out and out of sight, out of mind. But no, I've been watching everything y'all been doing and I'm still here and I'm going to be here. So yes. legacy. All right. Escape off the hook. So not a fluke, right? Because Humming Coming At You comes out, and this is just the thought that Jermaine Dupree, whom I have a contentious relationship with, um, in terms of rap production, but in R&B, not so much. He's a legend. I think he's one of the best, one of a legend in terms of R&B, because this is where his, his originality and his creativity shines. Whereas in rap production, I think he's very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Derivative. That um, part. That but, part. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You can say whatever you want to about his rap production or what he does or what he sounds like somebody else. In R and B, this small this man kicks ass. Yeah. Um, they are, did I not but, just say this exact thing yesterday? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. That's why I'm like, yeah. He's, <laughs> he's undeniable when it comes to R and B. So when I say off the hook, not a fluke. When you listen to this album, if you thought did Escape Home and Coming at You that they had that he gave them some good songs and they just managed to get over. Mm-mm. It's them and the material. Yeah. And you can't listen to this album and think otherwise. It's impossible. So yep. that's what I th- I agree. All right. <laughs> Jonasy. The show. <laughs> that's the party. The hotel. Okay. So. And I'll tell you in a minute while I'm laughing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Now, (laughs) okay, so here's the thing about this album, right? Classic R&B album, great album, great songs. But the thing about Jodeci that grinds my goddamn (laughs) gear, for some odd damn reason, these motherfuckers don't know how to sequence a goddamn album. At all. <laughs> let, me you, let me tell you, let me tell you, ooh, I'm gonna tell you about the show, the after party in the goddamn hotel. <laughs> you take the skits out this album. Take the skits out and listen Please. to this album. Please. All like, of them. <laughs> you're like, this shit is, it didn't have to go this way. It didn't have to go down this way. The reason why the show, the after party, the hotel was such a great album is because the songs individually are so insane that you could put them in any sequence that you wanted to, and it could still hit. And the only reason that, did, that there's any type of um, continuity, I'm using air quotes, continuity is because of the skits. Take the goddamn skits out. Yeah. Take the skits out. Take the skits out. I would, I've had this challenge for years. Hey, yo, resequence this album without the skits. Play it. Holy shit! This album is so much better than the than the after than the um than the show the after party the hotel as it is. So, one word to describe the show the after party the hotel, which is the album I banged forever, eighteen months straight, frustration. Mm-hmm. Because if you're just a casual music fan, you let it ride. If you're somebody that loves music and knows it inside and out and lives and breathes for this shit frustration this album could have been so much better so much concise and flowed so much better than it did you know my one word association for it is Hmm. basura (laughs) (laughs) i hate that album and 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 the big reason you know what i'm in the next day or two i'm gonna go make a playlist and i'm gonna uh and take the skits out and see how it goes. Because it is frustrating. Because I never really could get into it and repeat playback of it. Because mm-hmm. it was just a couple songs on it that I play. And then otherwise, I don't fool with it. 
That's what Sin does. He says with albums that don't have the right, you know, he does it. He puts it his own way. Because he'd be like, an album like this, you got to. Because at least you know I love interludes. I'm a big interlude head. These interludes can go. <laughs> like, it ruined it. It ruined this album for sure. That's why at least when you go so hard about be like, I hate this album. I'll be like, I agree. Because the interludes stink. And the, yeah, they, the, okay. they smell like they smell like cocaine and <laughs> 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 it smells like cocaine and trash hotel rooms. I don't know. But in the end, oh, like, oh. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a distinct smell. No. Um, I get it though. I get it though. I get it though. I'm you. You're not wrong. Um, <laughs> I'm going to revisit it and I'm going to reorder it and take out and see and, and just see what, just out of curiosity, you know, just for shits and giggles. That didn't have to be there. That didn't have to be there. That definitely didn't have to be there. That's why I'm <laughs> But that's why I laughed because when you said a list of albums you want to talk about, and I saw that one. I said, Jay, I hail to the now. And that's no. what I was going to talk about. Exactly. <laughs> hail to the now, now, now. <laughs> You already know. But hey, we just talked about it, so check. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. We done. All right. Um, Bonafide by John B. Also yeah. 95. I'm going to go with the word blindsided. Why? Yab yum. New label. <clears throat> Yeah, okay, I see where you go. Yeah. Because she's married to Babyface. I don't know if she's an actual creative or if this is nepotism. I don't know if the, she's a creative genius or Babyface and L.A. Reid have so much power that they could put anybody in any position. I was skeptical because, again, Pebbles, who is an excellent artist, always thought of herself as a visionary. And in the words of Cats from the Hood of Roxbury, in order to be a visionary, you got to do it again and again mm -hmm. and again. That's real. That's when real. When I somebody who was a visionary and saw it and made it happen, I think about folks like, you know, Mike Bivens, who saw another bad creation who didn't have that much talent. <laughs> Album get banged and cleaned up all of their dirt and make it seem like they had a viable career coming. They didn't. They didn't. <clears throat> they absolutely didn't. A dude who saw MC Brains and said, I could turn this motherfucker to a sex symbol. <laughs> that ain't no more MC Brains. Ain't no more MC Brains. Did you see him All Star Weekend? I didn't. <clears throat> but he saw Boys the Men and said, I, these motherfuckers are going to be the biggest thing on the planet. And they were. And they were. And he also said, I'm going to dress them like nerds. And everybody on the streets of the East Coast is going to be doing the same shit. We're going to call it the Alexander Pool era. What? One word. And I'd be goddamn <clears throat> 1992, 1993, people was walking down the street dressing like these fools. A dude with a cane who walked perfectly fine. He was doing vocals. <laughs> like it's the <laughs> That's what I mean by a visionary, right? Yeah, yeah. And there's so many other people, Puff, Sean Combs, you know, so many other women that showed up behind the scenes and was like, I'm going to dress you like this, do this. Misa Hilton, out of here. So many people that were actual visionaries, right? Yeah. She wasn't one. So when Tracy Edmonds got the Yab Yum deal, I was like, we'll see what happens. I'll be goddamn if that John B album didn't slap me across the face. I'll be damned if them John B videos yeah, yeah. didn't run BET yeah. and TV. And yeah. VH. How do you do that? Do you understand how hard it was to get your shit on BET, MTV, and VH1 in 95, 96? Horde. Horde. That's H-O-A-R-D. 
Horde, 3D, Horde. <laughs> um, and she did that. Yeah. And in order to do that, you have to have an idea of what works in terms of an artist developing them, knowing what lead single works, what second single works, what third single works, the visuals, how you gonna shoot the 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 albums, the single, the single covers, how you going to present this person, what they're gonna wear, who's yeah. doing the grooming, who's the barber, all of that shit. Yes, you have a team, but you have to have that vision in place. And Tracy Edmonds did that again and again and again and again. And I'm going to say it. Soul Food Soundtrack. Um, Tracy Edmonds did it again and again and again and again and again. And she proved that she was her own person and her own creator. So again, if I'm going to talk about uh, John B's album, that first album, Blindsided, because I expect that shit to hit like it did and to have the life it did and for it to launch his career. Okay, can we talk one thing about John B before, before we get off to this, something else? Yeah. There's a video John B did where he's in the club, white boy in the club with a lineup, a fresh lineup, a fade, wearing Timberlands in the club. I couldn't get in the club wearing Timberlands. How much <laughs> shoes do you have to have to be in a goddamn club with the baddest chick who looked like she could have been in um, Black Panther and could have been in Wakanda forever? That's your girl in the video, and you in the club wearing Timberlands. That's white privilege, but also that shit was fly. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> so, so I'm say. I was so, I was so, oh boy, oh shit. I was, uh, <laughs> I was so jealous. I was like, this motherfucker in the club with a cut off shirt and Timberlands in the back of the club, in the VIP <laughs> section of the club. Won't you come bubble with me? Doing the elbow dance, the shoulder dance. Won't you come bubble? I can't do that shit. <laughs> it's through the, the doorway of the club like Usher doing this shit. I couldn't do that. Mm -mm. But I can wipe the I can wipe the conversation off the window. Situations. I can do that shit all day. All the other stuff I can't do. <laughs> that, You're not in the budget. <sighs> what are we talking about? Oh God. Oh, it's not oh, me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I just felt something. I just felt the type of way. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. You know, I the 90s. Back then, I, I really thought that John B was just going to be a flash in the pan, that it was like kind of a gimmicky white boy, you know, comes to the hood thing. But then when I realized how musical he was and that he had, that he won't just get in the game, that he had been in the game. And then right. I'm like, he was just in the background. I was like, oh, okay. And then the yeah. albums was like amazing. Like, I, cool, relax. I still mm -hmm. run that regularly. How right. often did they try to find another John B and the shit didn't work? <clears throat> we tried Remy Shan, didn't work. Uh, do you remember the first go round for um, uh, for, for uh, Robin Thick when he was just thick? Yeah, when he was riding a bicycle with the Jesus mm -hmm. hair. Yes. Yeah. So like, there were so many times they tried to get us a new John B and the shit did not work like it did with John B. It just didn't. Mm -hmm. All right. And we're going to go with Faith Evans. <clears throat> okay. So Faith Evans, this is Faith, Faith Era. Um, what word can I use to describe this? Um, the next, right? Because Puff always felt like I gave the world Mary J. Blige, right? I presented Mary to the world. She became an entity onto herself, but he always felt like it's me and Mary. Even though Mary became her own per, her own artist, her own person, her an icon in her own right without just, I did this, me and Misa did this, I made this call. No, Mary was a sensation. Mary was a, a force. Mary was a phenomenon all in her own, right? But Puff wanted to do it again. Puff wanted to bring an R&B singer, an artist, somebody who could bridge that gap, somebody who had the, the, the serious R&B vocal chops, but could also sing 
on that soul funk that you could have got somebody to rap over type feel. But she necessarily doesn't even have to be a dance artist. Mary's going to be dancing. Mary's going to be with the dancers in the video wearing the same outfit. We're not doing that again. We, we don't need to do that again. We already got that out there. TLC fucking the whole, fucking whole shit up. They don't need background dancers. They are the background dancers, god damn it. Right, right. Like, they were the background dancers. This ain't a lie. This ain't a joke. Watch the backyard video. You see it. Um, but Talk about it. But um, when he, when Faith, with Faith, he was like, I'm going to do this again. She's going to be the next R&B star. It's going to be viable. And you're not going to look at her and say, she can't do this. She can't be this. She can't be that. Because God damn it, we're going to do it. And that's what he did with Faith. And that Faith album. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stray off to where it's not an R&B album, mm -hmm. but it's a whole lot of R&B like legends on this album. Cool. And we'll go with in '95 was Guru's Jazz Mataz Volume Two. Mm -hmm. And that's the one that had like Shaka on it, Michelle, mm -hmm. and all that. Yep. So the beauty of um, Jazz Mataz Volume Two was that. A lot of people saw Jasmine Taz as a one-off, and they kind of, some people kind of thought it was a fluke, right? Because when you think about, and I hated this tag, jazz rap, or the jazz rap era, oh, it yeah, a box. Like, this is what you do. This is all you do. Your music has to be jazz-influenced, or everything has to be jazz, or has to be in line with jazz. Otherwise, y'all not the viable artist. But also, it came with a, a double-sided thing where people thought that you're only working with these jazz artists in order to get accepted or be seen as viable in this other realm, this commercial realm. Because as a rapper, as an MC, the mainstream or this part of the mainstream media or culture or uh, the music industry <clears throat> doesn't see you as serious. But when you do Jazz all of a sudden they start seeing you in that light. When he did Jazz too, 2, it was like, no, I do this. I'm a master at this. And I'm going to prove it to you. Mm -hmm. Because this album is going to be even more concise. And it's going to hit all the things that we didn't do with the first album because it was kind of experimental. Because right. people didn't even think this would work. And mm -hmm. now we know it's going to work. Now I'm going to push it to the next level. So people are going to be able to come behind me <clears throat> and pull off a buckshot the funk. Okay. Yeah. You know, so people can actually under go back and revisit things like Greg Osby 3D Lifestyles. You know? So people can come back and they can understand that jazz melded with hip hop isn't an aberration, but instead it's a an continuation or mm. continuation. It works, you know? So I feel like reckoning is the perfect word for that because it made people realize that, oh, okay. Guru knows what he's doing. Yeah. And this is something that's going to continue to happen. And it wasn't just a one-off. It wasn't just a, a money grab. And also sadly enough, some of Guru and the people, his associates made the most money off these shows with these um, brilliant jazz musicians because they saw them as serious musicians as opposed to if they were to do a rap tour or a rap tour, they'd be lowballing them. So they used to do both. They do the rap show, get that money, then they bring out the, the jazz jazz tour and, and they'd have the same people, only they bring out the jazz musicians with them, get double the money, well, yeah. triple the money getting the regular money and then double the money for the fees. It's insane. Game the industry. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, and I was going through 95 and I was like, oh shit, that was 95. I was like, yeah, I gotta, we gotta talk about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, we did six today. Cause usually we do five. You'd be like, oh, that's it? <laughs> yeah, you right, you do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So please tell us what you got popping because you always got some shit popping. Always. 
Okay, so there was this time, right, when I had told y'all that I was putting out this book, and the book was called um, Instead of Evil. So mm -hmm. this thing called Omicron happened and pushed the book back a few months, right? So it was originally supposed to come out April 5th, 2022. The release date is now July 26th, 2022. So instead we became evil. Uh, the story is going to be Sleeman, S-L-E-I-M-A-N, with Dart Adams. And I'm going to be helping to tell his story. And again, it's the story of um, somebody from the MENA, MENA community, a uh, Palestinian refugee, leaves Lebanon, arrives in Germany, goes from Germany to a spot in Europe, and they arrive, they're instantly put into a housing development full of Arab immigrants and refugees directly across a river from another housing development full of Arab immigrants and refugees. And he faces discrimination, xenophobia, uh, harassment from the police, um, living in the street life as being an immigrant uh, and then just goes through all the hassles, the, the prison industrial system, the prison, the jail, the school to prison pipeline, which exists not just here, everywhere. Um, and it's a book that's a story that if it had been somebody who was American, it would have been an easier sell because you have stories like Rick Ross's out, a book, you know, you have stories like Gucci Mane's book, you know, but since it's somebody who's from overseas, who speaks another language, I had to find a way to make sure that people understood that the experience is universal and certain things translate and being harassed by police as a teenager when you're with your boys and, and, and dealing with police brutality and dealing with being seen as stupid just because you're from somewhere else when you're in the school system, this, everything's geared toward white people. Like all of that shit he experienced. And then he ma manages to survive the street life, the gang culture and become an artist. I could pull up videos that this man's done on YouTube that have millions upon billions of views. If you go on uh, DSPs, you'll find his songs have a disgusting amount of plays. And Stateside, almost no one knows who he is. But in Europe, his name's been in tabloids in the paper since he was a teenager, all because he was a non-white immigrant and he had faced every adversity possible. So instead we became evil is the thing that's really coming out. But like, I've done a lot of writing. Matter of fact, right now I'm writing a piece um, for, I've done a whole bunch of pieces for Boston Magazine about the experience mm -hmm. of being a Bostonian. Um, and I'm doing a piece right now for um, Boston Magazine that's basically about, um, in Boston, we have a, a burying ground, <clears throat> Cox Hill Burying Ground, one of the oldest burying grounds in America. <clears throat> it founded in 1659. Why it's unique is because Boston has the oldest, and people never talk about this, the oldest community in the colonies of freed people in the colonies. Starting in 1650, there was a community in the north end of Boston called uh, New Guinea. And it existed for about 200 years. And no one <clears throat> knows about it outside of Boston or Massachusetts, okay? And this community, there's no trace of it except for the over a thousand black Bostonians who are buried in Copps Hill burying ground which has about 10,000 people buried in it. And I visited every February for Black History Month to honor my ancestors in Boston. But the story I'm writing about specifically is that while there are over a thousand descendants of Africans and early settlers of Boston buried in this burial ground, uh, of those a thousand, I believe between five, four and six have existing legible gravestones, because for the most part, the black Bostonians that lived here early couldn't afford gravestones, and they had grave markers that are either made of wood or other material that has since um, deteriorated. So there's a whole stretch along what we call Snow Hill Street, where the black Bostonians are concentrated. 
And if you look off in the distance, you'll see rows of headstones, rows of headstones. Some of them are gone. Uh, there's 10,000 people buried. There's about 2,200 headstones still remaining in the spot, okay? To give you an idea of how long it's been. And some of the ones that the remain, you can't even read them. But there are records of who was buried there, right? The stretch along Snow Hill Street is almost bare. We know that there are bodies buried there because we know that that's where they buried the Black Bostonians from New Guinea. But of that whole stretch, there's one gravestone that sticks out and it's leaning to the left of a man named Abel Barbados. And every year I go back, I feel like it's leaning more to the left. And I'm right about that in this piece. And matter of fact, you know, it's, it's what I'm writing right now. I'm gonna submit it on the 28th. But that's what I'm doing right now. Um, I'm doing some other stuff in music that I can't really talk about because of NDAs and tech ain't cleared yet. But that's basically what I'm doing right now. It's all about the book, right? That book, my, that's going to be my first book on a major. The Book of Dart is an indie book. You know what I'm saying? And this book, on, the first book on a major is going to lead to the next book and the next book and the next thing that I do. So, like, my life started with the Book of Dart, kind of, but it really starts with instead they became evil because instead we became evil because everything jumps off from there. And now I've, I've worked on some books and other stuff, but I can't, again, can't discuss it until it's announced. Yeah. Yesterday's price, folks. Yes. Yes. It's, it's not. Right. If not today's today. price, is not yesterday's price. Mm -mm. <laughs> oh. So if y'all look and if y'all like not sick of me yet, you can go on um, Vimeo and you can find voices Voices on King 2022. It's a mini documentary that I'm in a lot more than I expected to be, uh, talking about my neighborhood and Black Bostonians and Dr. King and Mel King, who's another prominent Black Bostonian. And if you could find it, hopefully uh, Nesson has released the mini documentary um, Bell Biv DeVoe at Fenway Park, which I was uh, had a had a a good role in, which I didn't expect to have such a big role in, and that should probably be released to the public. And if not, I have to really email or talk to the directors, the people in Nesson, because everybody needs to see that. Everybody needs to see Bell Biv DeVoe at, at Fenway Park. Sure, it's a story that's inspirational to Bostonians because we are just not celebrated enough. Black Bostonians and their accomplishments aren't celebrated enough. And Boston really said, yo, y'all are homegrown. You've always repped the city. We need to really do right by y'all. And everybody came out to do it. And it's a beautiful thing. Shit almost brought me to tears. But I feel like it's not just the thing for Boston. I think everybody needs to see this because they, they really need their flowers. So mm -hmm. it is what it is. And, and down the line, I might be doing something new edition related for everybody. Maybe, probably, yes. <laughs> uh, well, <sighs> Now it's time to say goodbye oh, right. to all my Negro friends. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> really flip it like that, though. Did you flip it like that, though? <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, but we appreciate you as always. Um, yes. This was a lot of... It, it, I, we love having you because it's a lot of fun. Just yes. Like, like, like we enjoy like, it. Yeah, like Dar said, it's a, different, it's a different mood after every show we have done. Like, yeah. <laughs> Every time, I think that's the thing I I, I appreciate because I've been on other podcasts I'm, uh, th and things that I'm on, but it's kind of like you know what you're getting out of me. It's just mm -hmm. different. It's a different subject, but you know what you're getting out of me. But with each one of these, it's a different me because it's a different album and a different feeling and a different era and a different uh, narrative for each album. Yes. You know, so it's a different experience every time I come out, and it's a Different energy every time. And it's, I love it every time. It's great. Hey. So, yes, we appreciate everyone that checked us out. Like, click, subscribe, share, all that stuff. Yes. And we will catch y'all on the next Catch That. Peace.